Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, featuring your host, Anna Jaworski. Our program is a program designed to empower the CHD or congenital heart defect community. Our program may also help families who have children who are chronically ill by bringing information and encouragement to you in order to become an advocate for your community. Now, here is Anna Jaworski. Welcome to the fifth season of Heart to Heart with Anna. Our theme this season is Miracles Do Happen, and we have a great story to share today. Congenital heart defects, or CHDs, are the most common birth defect, and yet so few of us in the public know this fact until we have a baby born with a heart defect ourselves. While the statistics state that about 1 in 100 babies will be born with a CHD, those numbers are actually not correct. There are actually many more babies who are born with heart defects that are not counted by the American Heart Association or other organizations that count statistics, which choose to omit bicuspid aortic valve and certain other congenital heart defects. So we know that congenital heart defects are the number one birth defect. Even many medical professionals, however, don't know how common it is for a baby to be born with a CHD. It isn't something that all medical providers focus on, and thus it's something that can be easily overlooked in the delivery room or explained away in newborn follow-up appointments. Our show today, The Miracle of Survival for a Baby with a Critical Congenital Heart Defect, will feature heart dad Frank Jaworski. Frank Jaworski is a husband and father to two sons. His second son was born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, or HLHS. Frank is a nurse anesthetist who has worked in health care since before his first son was born. When his second son, Alex, was born, Frank was working in the intensive care unit, or ICU. He primarily worked in the adult cardiac ICU. Frank's wife, Anna, is an advocate in the heart community. Together, they started Baby Hearts Press 18 years ago, when Anna wrote a book about HLHS, but none of the medical publishers wanted to publish it. Frank drew all of the illustrations in the book. He also contributed to Anna's fourth book, The Heart of a Father, and provided all of the transition material in the book to keep the voice of the book male. Frank is currently the Vice President for Hearts Unite the Globe, a nonprofit organization for the heart community, a sponsor for this radio show. Welcome back to Heart to Heart with Anna, Frank. Thank you, Anna. I'm glad to be here. Well, first of all, I'm sure that most of our listeners recognize that the Anna that is your wife is me. So I just wanted to say that I'm happy that you can be on the show, not only as a guest, but as my husband. And I'm glad that we have this show where we can share about our experiences witnessing the miracles that happened with Alex. So why don't we go ahead and start by having you talk about Alex's birth from your perspective. Well, when Alex was born, unlike with my first son, whose birth seemed perfectly normal, Alex's birth was normal, but as soon as he was born, I said to the obstetrician, he seems to be breathing too fast. She didn't take any heed of what I said. She basically blew me off and said, no, that's just newborn breathing. Don't worry about it. I was concerned, even though I wasn't as experienced as she was, and as the days went on, I still felt that he was struggling to breathe, and I noticed that he was struggling to breathe when he fed and that he fell asleep very easily when he was feeding. So from the very start, it seemed to me that he was having difficulty breathing, and I didn't know what to do about it. Yes, we did notice that he had problems from the very beginning. He never woke up crying, wanting to be fed, or crying because he had a wet diaper, and I thought that was very strange because Joey let us know when he had a wet diaper or when he was hungry, and instead I had to set an alarm, and every three hours I had to feed him because he never woke up crying. So, yes, there were definitely feeding issues with him, but we went to the hospital every other day for the first 10 days of his life, and all of our concerns were explained away by the medical professionals. Your concern about the breathing was called newborn breathing. My concern about the jaundice and the problems with feeding were explained because he came three weeks early and they said he was a sleepyhead and he should have still been inside of me. So we just needed to expect him to be a different baby than Joey. So it seems to me that all of the professionals that we encountered had the opportunity to identify that Alex actually had a congenital heart defect, even though he never was blue, even though he didn't have some of the symptoms of congenital heart defects, he did have some classic symptoms like clubbing of the fingers and toes. He had the tachypnea, which you brought attention to over and over, the fast breathing. He also had tachycardia, and so we know that he had some of the classic symptoms of congenital heart defects, and yet nobody keyed in on that. So can you tell us what kind of training 
nurses typically get and why they may not have training in identifying babies who have congenital heart defects, how the signs and symptoms of being in congestive heart failure may be different for babies than for adults. Well, in my opinion, the reason why most nurses don't get sufficient training to easily notice things like congestive heart failure in babies is simply because there is so much material that is learned during nursing school. And the same applies to physicians. Physicians learn a great deal, and they don't necessarily have a focus on pediatrics. I think that specifically trained nurses, experienced nurses in pediatrics, are more likely to pick up on these kinds of things. But I was a certified emergency nurse and saw many children in emergency conditions, but I still didn't notice this because when we saw children who were ill or sick or brought to the emergency room for any reason, what we were looking for usually was signs of common illnesses like infections, respiratory problems, perhaps injuries of some kind. But congenital heart defects were low on our list of sensitivities. So even though I was a trained emergency nurse, I missed it for precisely what it was, although I was suspicious of something. And I think that many nurses miss these kinds of things. I was an experienced nurse in the adult cardiac ICU, and... My experience there didn't help me a whole lot because adults with congestive heart failure tend to have obvious signs like difficulty breathing that's worsened by laying flat. They like to sleep sitting up in a chair. They get swelling in their ankles and feet, which is caused by congestion of fluid in their extremities. And in extreme cases of congestive heart failure, they'll have a frothy sputum on their lips that comes up out of their lungs because of the fluid overload in their lungs. These signs weren't so common in babies, and so the differences were significant. Right, and I think that's really important for people to know that that there is a big difference between babies and adults and the symptoms that they present. Babies are not little adults. Babies have their own signs and symptoms, and Alex did have a lot of the signs and symptoms of being in congestive heart failure, especially as he got older and was no longer a newborn when he was six weeks old, seven weeks old, eight weeks old, and he was breathing so hard that he had a cleft in his chest. That should have been a huge red flag to the medical professionals we brought Alex to that there was something seriously wrong and it was no longer newborn breathing. But I think this is something that we'll talk about more in the next segment and especially about what kind of advice you can give to other nurses and to parents who suspect there might be a problem with their children. But for right now, we need to take a quick commercial break. Don't leave yet. When we come back, Frank will tell us about some lessons that he has learned in raising a son with a congenital heart defect and some lessons for nurses and others in the healthcare profession. We'll be right back. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today our topic is the miracle of survival for a baby with a critical congenital heart defect, and it features heart dad, Frank Jaworski. We just finished talking with Frank about what it was like to be a cardiac nurse and have a baby with a severe congenital heart defect, and now we're going to talk a little bit more about Alex. So, Frank, a year after Alex's first open-heart surgery, you told me that the people who had examined Alex at the hospital where he was born gave you a medical opinion that, in their professional opinion, they didn't think Alex would survive the transport to the hospital in San Antonio that was going to treat him. Can you tell us about how that story affected you and what exactly was said? I do recall, I don't remember some of the things that were said, I do recall that Dale Baum, who was a cardiac fellow who did the initial echo on Alex in the hospital, was not an experienced pediatric cardiologist, but he had recognized the severity of the heart defect and, of course, insisted that he be transferred immediately. I know that when I talked to him, he wouldn't look me in the eye. I think he was concerned about Alex's future. And I think an important lesson here is that until Alex was picked up as having a heart defect, people weren't looking for a heart defect. They were looking for other things. They were looking for newborn breathing. They were looking for possibility of cystic fibrosis initially on his admission. And then once people realized he had a heart defect, what they thought about was this is a very heart defect. And so I think perhaps their concern about his risk for transport was based on the numbers they had seen before for children with severe heart defect and the poor survival. So Mm -hmm. I didn't know enough to be scared at the time. I did know the people that I respected seemed to be scared, and so I was very much aware. 
I didn't know what to expect, so I just hoped for the best. Right. I know that it was really hard for me because I had never been in an ambulance before, unlike you, who had been a paramedic and had been in an ambulance many times. And it was really scary for me to be in the back of the ambulance. I feel lucky now that they even let me ride with Alex, but I didn't know that it was unusual to have a doctor in the back of an ambulance with you until much, much later. Why don't you go ahead and talk to our listeners real quick about the diagnosis that Alex did ultimately receive when we went to San Antonio and how many operations he had in his first year of life. Absolutely. When Alex was first received in San Antonio, they took him from what looked like a fairly normal condition. He was breathing oxygen on cardiac monitors and had an IV in place. I believe he had an IV in place. They pretty much progressed from there to intubating him and placing IVs and access for monitoring and, and watching them very closely. And it seemed like a, like a huge rush, a big deal to us. And uh, I believe it was less than 24 hours later he had his first cath. Is that right? That's right. Yes. And his first catheterization happened then. He had another catheterization when he was, oh, 8 or 10 years old, kind of a diagnostic to see where he stood. But, of course, the major thing was the three cardiac surgeries he had, one at the age of 8 weeks, one at the age of 10 months, and one more when he was 17 years old. And each one of those surgeries was traumatic in its own way. The first one, because we didn't know what to expect. The second one, because we did know what to expect and had to hand our child over to the surgeons again. But in both those cases, he was an infant, didn't really know any better. He just just smiled at us and went his way. When he was 17 and had his surgery, he knew what was coming to a certain degree, and it was a lot scarier for him and for us. So we've been through quite a few changes with him. Right, and initially he was diagnosed with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which was something neither you nor I had ever heard of before, until right. we were told that it was the same heart defect that baby Faye had, and of course, since we were children of the 80s, you know, or we were teenagers in the 80s, we remembered hearing about baby Faye, never would have guessed that we would have a child with that same heart defect ourselves. So that was quite a shock for both of us, I think, don't you? Absolutely. I recall hearing the story of the UFA and then how, how severe that was, and that, that was terrifying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they weren't doing baboon heart transplants when Alex was needing his surgery, so we weren't sure what kind of options he had. However, we were told that he was in such bad shape because he was also in congestive heart failure that he wasn't a candidate for a heart transplant. So the only option was for him to have the Norwood procedure, And yet, none of his doctors recommended that. They all recommended that we take him home to just let him die. And they only gave him a 5% chance to survive the surgeries. I don't know how that made you feel. It made me so unbelievably terrified. I didn't even want to stay in the room any longer with the doctors while they were telling us the prognosis. I wanted to run out of the room and just hold Alex, thinking that if he was in my arms, he would be safe. Well, I know, I understand how how terrifying that was. Of course, we were there together. I don't recall specifically reacting to the percentage risks. All I knew was, as we've said ourselves before, that he really had a 50-50 chance. Either he would make it or he wouldn't. And we were in the best possible place, as far as we knew. And we had to take our chances there and just be as as good for him as we could, as supportive as we could. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, I think that we were both really united on that, and that really helped. The fact that neither you nor I wanted to choose compassionate care, but both of us wanted to proceed with whatever could be done to help him made me feel a lot better because I knew that we were in it together and we weren't going to give up on him. And here he is 20 years later still with us, so I think we made the right decision without a doubt. Um, Yes, absolutely. Can you... (laughs) <laughs> Can you tell us one lesson that you've learned in this experience, first as a father and then as a nurse? Well, as a father, I think that what I have learned, oh, I've learned so many things from this. I have learned to, to how do I put this, to trust my own judgment when it comes to observing my children for their health. And I guess that applies to other members of my family also. If I see things that I'm concerned about, I should speak up about it and pursue it because you can be right and the, other, the professionals can be wrong. As a nurse, I've learned the converse, which is listen to parents and listen to what they say, listen to the families, because they may see things that you don't based on observations that you have no access to. I think one of the really important things, and I mentioned this earlier in the show, is that you tend to see what you're looking for. And if you don't think about congenital heart defects, you can look right at it and not see it. So you have to open your mind up to all the possibilities and think about what could be happening. So as a nurse, that's very important for me because it's very easy to have tunnel vision and just see what you expect. So, right. 
That's all great advice. We do need to take another quick commercial break, but don't leave yet because when we come back, Frank's going to share with us what miracle he felt he has witnessed in being the father of a son with a critical congenital heart defect and what advice he has for other parents awaiting the birth of a baby with a heart defect. Anna Jaworski has spoken around the world at congenital heart defect events, and she is available as a keynote or guest speaker for your event. Go to hearttoheartwithanna.com to learn more about booking Anna for your event. You can also find out more about the radio program. Keep up to date with CHD resources and information about advocacy groups, as well as read Anna's weekly blog. Anna wants you to stay well-connected and participate in the CHD community. Visit hearttoheartwithanna.com today. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today our topic is the miracle of survival of a baby with a congenital heart defect, and it features her dad, Frank Jaworski. We just finished talking with Frank about what he learned as both a nurse and a father of a son with a congenital heart defect. We only have a few minutes left, but I would like for Frank to share with us a little bit about what he feels the miracle was that he experienced in having Alex. So, Frank, you've always been so great at helping me in our roles as advocates for the congenital heart defect community. You drew illustrations for the HLHS handbook, and you helped me with the heart of a father, but you've never really talked out loud about the miracle that you've witnessed in having Alex. So can you tell us what miracle you felt you experienced with having Alex? Absolutely. I'd be happy to talk about the the miracles that I witnessed. Really, they're twofold. In one sense, because I was already an experienced paramedic and emergency nurse and ICU nurse, I'd seen people die. I'd seen children die, which a lot of people have not seen, and it's hard to grasp the idea that your child can die. So having seen that and seen how severe Alex's illnesses were, absolutely, his survival of any of the surgeries in his level to adulthood and how well he's doing now is in itself miraculous. And I don't know how to qualify that. I don't know if that's God's direct intervention or if we got lucky or what it is, but it seems miraculous to me. Another aspect of the miracle is the many people that came together to take care of Alex, that brought their skills together, the pediatricians, the paramedics that transported him, the surgeons and nurses, every single person who took care of him, both here at our home hospital in Temple and in San Antonio, they all worked so hard, and every piece of the work they did contributed to his survival. And that, in a sense, is a miracle, too, that's ongoing. It helps other people, too. I think you're right, and one of the things that we haven't really shared with many people is that Alex went for his two-month well baby checkup, and we had no idea that he was going to be admitted that day. We thought he was just going to have the regular checkup that Joey had had when he was two months old, and instead I voiced the same concerns we had been voicing for eight weeks, worried about the breathing, worried about him not feeding well, worried about him not waking up to eat. All of those things I had already talked about for eight weeks, but this time he also had not gained any weight. And so all of a sudden, he was considered a failure to thrive baby, and he was admitted. I finally dragged out of the pediatrician that she felt he had cystic fibrosis, and so he was scheduled for a whole slew of exams. But, Frank, you are so right. A miracle occurred when the night nurse came in after Alex had been admitted and saw me patting Alex on the back. I was holding him, and he was breathing so hard that his head was moving back and forth. And the nurse asked me if he always breathed like that. And I said, yes, but it was getting worse. And she asked me about his x-ray, and I told her that he had had a whole slew of tests, but that there had been no x-ray. And so she took the resident aside and asked him about an x-ray, and he said, no, 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 we're giving him a sweat test first thing in the morning. And she took the resident out of the room, and when she came back in, she said, he's going to have an x-ray. You need to be prepared for that. And I said, okay, because it was already evening. And then at midnight, she came back in the room and she asked me how the x-ray had gone. And I said he hadn't had an x-ray. So she called around and found out that the portable x-ray machine was broken and asked me if I would be willing to walk down to the ER. And once the x-ray was taken, they canceled the cystic fibrosis test and everything went into fast forward. All of a sudden, the next morning, he had an echo. And that's when we discovered that he didn't have cystic fibrosis. Instead, he had a heart defect. And I think if it wasn't for that nurse, we could have lost him. Yes, I agree. And that that is miraculous, too. She was definitely part of the miracle. Yeah. 
But she wasn't the only one. You're right. There were so many people. I I know that Dr. Calhoun is one of the miracle makers in this story because he's operated on Alex three times. And Alex was given such a dismal prognosis with his first surgery that the fact that he did come through, and not only did he come through, but... All of a sudden, he was able to nurse like he had never nursed before, and he was discharged faster than any other Norwood baby that Dr. Calhoun had operated on. And they were afraid to discharge him because he had such a fast recovery that he astounded them. And so I think that was a miracle, too. Yes, absolutely. As we said, there are so many parts to this miracle. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, though, because I know that as a nurse, you don't like to use that word, miracle. Well, I do like to believe that the hard work we put into it matters, too. But still, there are things that can't be explained. Uh, there's no explanation for why he did as well as he did, as late as he did, in spite of not being diagnosed until the age of eight weeks. And we were lucky. We were lucky in so many ways. And if the label of miracle fits, then that's where it goes. I think that one of the things that our listeners need to know is that Alex is not a typical HLHS patient. While most HLHS babies have a very small or a hypoplastic left ventricle, which Alex did too, it's also very common for HLHS babies to have valve problems. And our Alex was really lucky that way in that his valves were very good. He also had transposition of the great vessels, which meant that his bigger ventricle or his right ventricle was doing the work that needed to be done. And he had a huge VSD and an ASD and PDA and he had a coartation and Oddly enough, having all of these different defects actually allowed some to compensate for each other, and that's why he never was blue when he fed. He wasn't blue when he cried because his oxygen was mixing in his blood. It was mixing all over the place. And in a way, that's a miracle too, wouldn't you say, Frank? Absolutely. Yes, I agree. Well, what advice would you give to parents who are expecting a child with a congenital heart defect knowing what you know now? Well, the way you phrased that question is interesting because we didn't expect a child with congenital heart defect. And a lot of times now do expect a child who has a prenatal echocardiogram. So I would say if you're expecting a child who has a congenital heart defect, you should educate yourself the best that you can so you understand what's going on. Try to be an advocate for your child by really being involved in their care and, and understanding what's happening. I think it's important that as parents that you take care of yourself and be kind to yourself. Give yourself a break when you can and take care of each other. Be understanding of each other because you're going to have arguments and problems because you're both stressed out and not because you necessarily have anything to argue about. You're just both very scared and worried. And so you have to be kind to yourself and kind to your partner and focus on your child and put other things aside. I know that when Alex was first diagnosed, I was working in the emergency room at the time. I was one of the nurse managers. I was in the middle of a day of management classes, and you called me at noon and said Alex is being admitted. And I have no idea what happened to the rest of that management class. All I know is I walked away from it. (laughs) That's the kind of thing you have to do. You have to focus on taking the child. Right, right. I agree. I like that advice, especially the part where you said for us to be kind to ourselves. I think everybody deals with stress in a different way, and everybody deals with grief. And the minute you're told that your baby could die, you start the grieving process, and everybody goes through that in a different way. So it's easy for a husband and wife, even a husband and wife who love each other as much as you and I do, for us to be at odds and for us not to be the best that we usually are, and that can cause problems. So being kind to each other and being kind to yourself, knowing that you are not at your best. We weren't sleeping regularly. We weren't eating the way we usually do. Everything was out of the ordinary, and we didn't have our whole family together. Joey had to stay behind and was with other family members, so we knew he was safe, but it wasn't the same as having our whole nuclear family with us. So, Frank, as a nurse, you have seen this in both ways. You've been the person providing the care to the families, and now you've been on the opposite side. You've been the family receiving the care. What kind of advice would you give to medical professionals who are working with families who have children with congenital heart defects? Well, I think, first of all, that you need to respect the parents and the child if the child is old enough to understand what's going on and explain things to them the best you can. Don't assume they won't understand. Explain it to them if you can. If you're lucky to have somebody like myself who's medically trained in the family, then use them as a conduit, as an interpreter to explain things to the rest of the family and give them a little more detail so they understand what's going on. I think, just as I said, you should be patient with each other as parents, that medical professionals need to be patient with the families also. I think that the stress that happens can come out in odd ways. They can 
get angry at people who are taking care of their child just because they're frustrated. It doesn't mean that they're mad at you necessarily. You have to be very kind to them. You have to be very gentle with them because they're dealing with things that you can't even really grasp. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. They don't know. I mean, they don't know the stress that you're feeling when you're not with your other child or when your other child has been on the phone with you and is crying because they miss home and they miss their mommy and daddy and the stress of having to deal with that. You don't see that at the hospital because the child isn't there. And, of course, 20 years ago when we were in the hospital with Alex, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have computers that we could keep connected with our families. And so the only way to do it was to go out in the hallway and talk on the phone for a very short period of time before we went back in the room to be with Alex. So I found that very, very stressful. I think people have it a little bit easier today with the ease of communication, don't you think? Yes, I do. I think that does make it easier. You have to also guard your privacy a little bit, too, because it's too easy for everybody that you know to call you, try to find out what's going on. So. That's true. That's true. We ended up kind of setting up a system where we called people in the family and then they called everybody else. So we weren't having to give the same news five or six or seven times. And I know a lot of families do that in the hospital. Well, that was excellent advice. I really think that you kind of understand this whole situation in a different way than most people do. And I really appreciate you sharing your experience with us, Frank. Well, you're welcome. And the things that we've gone through have been very hard, but if we can use those to help educate other people and help them to get through these things, then that's good. Absolutely. So with that, that concludes this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thanks for listening today. Please come back next week on Tuesday at noon Eastern Time. Until then, please find and like us on Facebook. Check out our website, hearttoheartwithanna.com, and our Cafe Press Boutique. Follow our radio show, and remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you've been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time. We'll talk again next week.